Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the worship of God here at Westminster. At the end of the pews, you'll find a pew pad. If you could sign your name and pass it on down to those you are worshiping with, we would appreciate it. Also, in your pew racks, you'll find prayer request cards. If you have a prayer request, please fill out the card and give it to one of the ushers as we sing our second hymn. Also in the pew rack, you'll find a visitor card. If you're a uh, first-time visitor, we ask that you fill one of those out and place it in the offering plate when the offering is taken. Are there announcements? Good morning. Uh, last Wednesday, we, we uh, kicked off the um, College Student Oasis program, and that involves, per, uh, for the congregation, preparing a dinner for um, college students on Wednesday nights. And there are 13 um, Wednesday nights that you can sign up for. If anybody is not interested in making dinner for college students, I'll be sitting at a table in the fellowship hall after uh, service, and I'll have an information sheet. It's really easy to do if um, you want to make dinner and would like reimbursement for the materials, you can get reimbursed. So see me after service, and thank you very much. Good morning. Next Sunday, 5.30 here, pork chop dinner. We have alternative options, chicken and vegetarian. And um, there'll be a free will offering. The students, of course, are free. Uh, the entertainment, um, our own um, men's group, and uh, one of our best local band, Jazz in Progress. And um, so we hope you, if you haven't signed up yet, that you do so after service. Please remember, if you're coming, to bring your own table uh, serving. And if you can, a dish to pass. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everybody uh, again and again, pictorial directory time. Uh, we'll be signing up for having your photos done uh, at the week of October 4th through the 7th. And so we hope that we want a true representation of our congregation. So we want everybody, members and friends, to make sure you get signed up to have your pictures taken. Thank you. We'll be out in the North X today. And it's also available online on the church website. Good morning. Um, just Two very quick things. First is just a um, personal note of thanks for everybody who prayed for me and sent me notes and has asked about me this morning. That was really appreciated and made me feel so loved. So thank you. Um, second is, um, as you may have seen in the news and views, the church has a new standing commission. It is the Commission on Diversity and Allyship, otherwise known as CODA. Um, and CODA is charged with ensuring that all who seek to develop their faith in Jesus Christ are welcomed and encouraged to fully participate in all areas of life in the church. And so we're going to be doing a lot of um, educational opportunities on issues that um, deal with all sorts of um, diverse communities, um, race and disability and immigration status, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so anyone is welcome and encouraged to join. Right now our regular meeting time is the third Sunday of the month at 8.30 in the morning before church. So I know that's kind of early, but um, we do a lot of good work and we'd love to have um, more voices included. So if you would like to join, you may speak with me or with Jeanette Biava, who is our secretary, or you can contact the church office. Thank you. Hello, a new month, so a new for our neighbors. For our neighbors, this month is the NIU Husky 
food pantry. The students are back, as we all know, and that means they need stuff. So um, what they're asking for at the pantry is instant rice, pasta meals, and canned vegetables seem to be the things that are required the most. Thanks. Let's stand up and <laughs> greet one another. You know, the scriptures tell us to greet one another with a holy kiss. So shake hands. remain standing for the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Jesus said, and you will rest us for your souls. In gentleness and humility, let us come before God.
Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us join together in the prayer of confession and confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people say, Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. As God's own people, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind. Be always ready to forgive as freely as God has forgiven you. And, above everything else, be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for you.
So this summer, I went to a funeral for a man who I thought was a very, very special man. And his son spoke at his funeral, and he said, I think of my dad as an ordinary man who did extraordinary things. And I thought, what a cool thing to say. And I fact, I liked it so much that I put that saying on one of the bulletin boards outside my classroom. Be an ordinary person who does extraordinary things. Because I think adults and kids need to be reminded at times that even though we may not be the fastest or the strongest or the best or the richest or the most powerful, we can still make a really big difference in the lives of others. Today, in one of our Bible passages, we hear about a man who was an ordinary man who went on to do really extraordinary things, but he had something really special that allowed him to do this. So it happened a long, long time ago, and God's people, the Israelites, were living in Egypt, and the ruler of Egypt, or the king, or the pharaoh of Egypt, he was treating them really really badly. And God decided, you know what, he had to save his people. And he decided he wanted a leader that could help them be saved. And he picked an ordinary man. So this ordinary man's name was Moses. And Moses wasn't the strongest. He wasn't the most powerful. He wasn't the richest. He wasn't the smartest. And in fact, he wasn't even a very good speaker to lead people. And one day Moses was out in the wilderness and he was watching his father-in-law's sheep and he looked off to the side and there was this bush. And this bush was totally on fire. Now, in a desert it's really dry, so you would think that the bush would burn up and then be done, but it didn't. The bush burned and burned and burned and it never got burned up. And then a voice, it was God's voice, came out of the bush and said, Moses, I want you to lead my people. And you know what Moses said? He said, God, I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy. I don't think I'm your person. I, I'm not a good speaker. I don't know enough people. I, I'm really not a leader. And you know what God said to him? He said five words. He said, I will be with you. I will be with you. And knowing that God was with him, allowed Moses, an ordinary man, to do some pretty extraordinary things that we're going to learn about in the next few weeks in the Bible. And that's a really good message for us to remember, too, that sometimes things are hard or we can come up with excuses for why we shouldn't help people or we shouldn't do something. And we have to remember that God is with us always, too, just like he was with Moses, and he will help us ordinary people do extraordinary things. So I brought you a picture of the burning bush. And there's Moses looking at it. This is what they think. So you can take those, and I want you to put it somewhere where you can look at it each morning and remember all day through everything that happens, your happy things, your sad things, your hard things, your scared things, God is always with you. Will you say a prayer with me? Dear God, we thank you for the story of Moses that reminds us that you are with us through everything. Help us to see the possibilities in the world this week where we can do extraordinary things and make a difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join with me in the prayer for illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Our Old Testament lesson for this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to, called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Our response is from Psalm 105 and can be found in the bulletin and will be read responsibly. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Let the earth rejoice in his glory. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful, and he made them stronger than their foes. Whose hearts he then turned to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. Praise the Lord. For our New Testament readings, we start with the book of Romans, reading from chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. The Apostle Paul addresses the church at Rome and writes, Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. 
outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Know if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, we read in chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, and this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold it up as we sing our next hymn so that the ushers can collect the request.
may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we come to your words of life this day, move our hearts, shape us by what we hear, transform us by the power of your spirit, and help us live as people who love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. New York City is crowded and real estate is at a premium. The humor, humor writer Calvin Trillin always used to talk about the fact that it would be helpful in the obituaries if they would include what size apartment they left behind in addition to the number of sons and daughters. You know, in addition to our beloved family, they leave a two-bedroom flat with a view of the park. That kind of information would be helpful. And the city of Rome was that kind of city. It was jam-packed. It was one of the first times in human history that they had tried to put a million people in a single place. There were, ro there were rules about how the roads could be used. And many times a day, any kind of handcarts were banned from actually being in the city of Rome. The human traffic was so great. And in the church at Rome, which was a significant congregation, even as the Apostle Paul writes to it, there had been a tragic event that affected all the Jewish members of the Christian church at the time. And in 50, the year 50, they had cast out all the Jewish citizens out of the city of Rome. And that had impacted the people in the church. Now, some years later, they were allowed to return, but like many times when a, a statement that comes down that says you have to give up your homes, well, the people who take over those homes grow rather fond of them. And that tension in the church between the Jewish Christians and between those Christians who had Gentile backgrounds shows up in the letter. And Paul is constantly working with what does this salvation mean for Jews and Gentiles both. And so as we come to this part of the letter, the ethical section of the letter, it's helpful for us to remember that history. And that there were likely people in the congregation who had seen actual benefits from having the Jewish part of the congregation driven out of the city and they were able to take over their housing. And so when the Jewish people came back into the city and had to rebuild their lives, well, I'm sure they bore certain kinds of resentments against the Gentile Christians who had never had to leave. And so when Paul finally comes to giving ethical advice in the course of the letter. His comments come to people who had real things to forgive and real issues about love. Now let's think a bit for the, about the book of Romans in which you have a number of chapters devoted in the early going about the nature of the human condition. It is a condition alike, both for Jew and Gentiles, that sees us estranged from God. And he gives the remedy to this estrangement in the next series of chapters, particularly chapters 5 through 8, in which he talks about um, the nature of our redemption and how it can never be something that we boast about or claim as our own, but always comes as God's gift. Uh, and it is unexplainable in many ways why the gift comes to some and not to others. And particularly in chapters 9 through 11, he makes a point of saying those who seem to be outside of God's plan, those who haven't yet had the light come on for them, those are still people in God's care. And we can never presume that that light's not going to come on. And so he talks about the great themes of life, the nature of humanity, 
the nature of redemption, what God's providence is about. And having looked at those great themes, he then starts to talk about how then shall we live. And this is what we hear. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Um, it is likely, I mean, I know a number of you people work in the same places, and it's likely that you have had encounters with church members that leave you scratching your heads. Here you are, working in this good cause at the university, a cause that may see to your advancement, a cause that may have reason to actually benefit the institution, and then suddenly you find yourself blocked by somebody you're sitting next to every Sunday. And you go, what is wrong with that person? Or maybe you were in an industry here in town and you just felt like it was that individual's personal vendetta against you that cost you your job. And I'm sure that for the Jewish and Gentile Christians gathered in the church at Rome, there was the same kind of issues in which they had benefited from other ways that some had been hurt. And you just go, what is wrong with those people? Uh, this is an old story. I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, so my mother taught Sunday school for years, and the woman who helped her for years, they were good friends, and they worked together. And both uh, my dad and her husband worked at Boeing. And there was a strike. And dad worked for management. He kept going to work. And this other guy worked for labor, and he walked the picket lines and didn't get any money. And finally, the strike, of course, was resolved. But even after the resolution, uh, this particular individual made it a point to never speak with my dad because he hadn't honored the picket line. There was a real breach between them. He felt like he had been harmed by this lack of support from the church person. And so they never spoke. Probably stories like that in here. Probably people you make it a point not to talk to. Probably people in the church at Rome who had benefited from seeing the Jewish people driven out of the city. Well, they probably weren't that easy to talk to one another. And what does Paul say? Not avoid each other carefully. He says, let love be genuine. Let's never assume this is offered in a place where there is not real pain and real discrimination and real hurt. Let's never assume that this command to love comes to another world in which an ideal kind of church world where bad things never occur. Let love be genuine. And so we try again even with broken people who can't see things clearly like they should. Let love be genuine. And on top of that, he says, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering. So that love thing is good, and we should do that always, and we keep figuring out new ways to do that, even for those people that hurt us, especially for those who hurt us. But there's a way to keep that renewed in us. And Paul talks about rejoicing in hope. Now, he has scratched his head all the way through chapters 9 through 11, wondering about those people who can't seem to catch on to what this Christian business is about. 
But he does want us to know that there is always our hope. And so we keep praying, we keep casting seeds about, we keep remembering that there is a call for us to be faithful in this world, and we get to rejoice in the God who so freely gives the spirit and so willingly gives a call. That story about Moses is a good one because Moses um, had fallen from great heights in Egypt and had now had to work for his father-in-law who is described as the priest at Midian and we know he couldn't have been Jewish because the faith hadn't been invented yet. So he is working for his father-in-law who has another religion. And he's herding sheep, which is like the worst job you can get. And maybe that's what happens when you work for family. I don't know. Maybe some of you have worked for family. Maybe that's how it comes out. And Moses gets a call. And he has all kinds of reasons why he shouldn't get the call. And notice what God says to Moses. Well, all right, I'll affirm your call when you get out of town and you are at worship. Uh, I'm sure Moses wished for more immediate help. You know, like, do something before we leave town. That could be a thing. That might be some usefulness. But no, that's not what God promises. He says, just come. Find a way to have joy in me in this call and come and worship. So we rejoice. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of those whom we find it difficult to love, we rejoice. Because that hope is ours. It's been given so freely. It's a promise that we have that holds us up. Rejoice. We've got hope in our lives. Rejoice. The Apostle Paul also tells people to persevere in prayer. It's just part of a series of commands that show up in this passage, but it really struck me as so essential to our lives in the face of faith. Persevere in prayer. So we stick to this task, we find a way to love, and we stay with the prayers that we have been called to offer, even for those who don't seem to get it even for those who seem outside of the faith, even for family that gives us tough tasks. Persevere in prayer. And so, on our knees, in our homes, on Sunday morning, we have a reason to come back again and again and talk to God. And not only to talk, but also to listen. And see where it is that God might be leading us now and where God might have a particular task for us to do. Um, this past week, I uh, had a chance to be on vacation. Our uh, kids actually sent us away on a trip. Um, and they brought us back, which I thought was good. I thought that was good. Um, it was for our 40th anniversary. We actually celebrated our 41st anniversary on the trip. It takes boys a little longer to get organized. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. But when we got to the park, we were surprised to find that there were, uh, we went to Glacier National Park, and we were surprised to find there was a forest fire going on while we were there. It was not a big deal. And it certainly didn't make national news. With all the national news about the awful flooding going on in Houston and that terrible uh, tragedy there. But while we were in the park, you could think of almost nothing else because we were in a place where you could see the smoke billowing up. Um, I mean, you go to, to a, a park and you expect to have kind of campfires going on, but we always smelled like smoke all week. And um, at one point, 
at night you could actually see the trees bursting into flame like a, like a candle or something. They would just explode up and there'd be a little flare on the mountaintop. It was a remarkable thing to see. Um, but that became our reality in our world, was hearing news about that fire and seeing the people fight it. Um, actually moving from one of the lodges that we stayed at to a place a little farther away from the main line of the fire fighting. All of us in our lives have events that consume our present. They make it hard to see what's going on in a larger world. But there's something about being in prayer and praying earnestly that broadens us out. And it keeps us from looking at only our own corner of the world and looking at the broader needs that are out there. Persevere in prayer, because being in prayer is going to change what you see and know about the world around you. It just will. It just will. And then finally, there's this incredible paragraph that doesn't come just out of the blue, but it comes to people that have been persecuted and will be persecuted in the future. We know that this letter to the Romans was written before Nero's wholesale persecution of Christians in the early 60s. Letter probably written between 54 and 58 AD, and then Persecution of Christians will take on in earnest in the early 60s. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Uh, I really don't know what I can add to what Paul has to say there about the difficult task that Christians have taken on of offering blessing to those who persecute them. Uh, what an extraordinary call we have. And to be a blessing in a world in which fewer and fewer people now choose a Christian option, in a country where so often it seems that to have faith is to run against a culture of consumption and consumerism and acquisition. But we get to be a blessing, and what a gift. We don't have to bear grudges. We'll leave that to God. We don't have to decide who our enemies are. But instead, we just get to offer God's blessings to the world. What a remarkable thing. What a great call. Thanks be to God for the chance to love our enemies the chance to persevere in prayer, for the hope that never fails, and for the love that we get to so freely give. To God be the glory. Amen. Okay, I'm pretty sure I got the service of ordination when I left my office, but let me check. We may have to sing a hymn or something. I don't know. Let's. Okay, here we go.
There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make his true church useful in the world. And we call men and women to face so that in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Alexa Bacchus and Ryan James as deacons have been duly elected by this congregation for their offices. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for a particular work as ministers of the word, as ruling elders, or as deacons. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And if he wants to be first among you, he must be the slave of all, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set others free. It is the duty of deacons to be models of Christ's love for his church, showing compassion and doing works of service and mercy on behalf of the people of God, remembering especially the bereaved, the forgotten, the impoverished, and oppressed with the light and hope of the gospel. The deacons are also to serve in ways asked to by the elders, striving ever to enrich the welfare, fellowship, and service of the congregation. It is the duty of the deacons to serve as models of Christ's compassion to the church and the world. Will the congregation please rise and join me in the affirmation of faith found in your bulletin? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, our only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated, and will Alexa and Ryan please come forward at this time? God has called you by the voice of the church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe, and you understand the work for which you have been chosen. Please show your purpose by giving answer to these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you? If so, answer, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable ex expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, answer, I do. 
Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, answer, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, answer, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, answer, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, answer, I do. Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, answer, I will. I will. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will. And now the congregation is asked to answer these questions. Do you, the members of this church, accept these people as your deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we do. Do you agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? If so, answer, we do. we do. We now come to the prayer of installation and we invite those who have been previously ordained as elders, deacons, or as minister of the word and sacraments to participate in the laying on of hands. If you are unable to place your hand upon the ordinance, please place your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you. Will the congregation please rise? Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you mindful of the concerns raised this day. For the people of Houston, whose world has been swept away by the hurricane, we ask for prayers for all those hurting as a result of the exclusionary Nashville statement. May they be reminded that God's love and grace for all God's children. We pray for this nation and especially Texas and Louisiana after flooding during this national time of prayer. We pray for someone's brother, Frank, who is undergoing chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer, for another friend that is undergoing cancer treatments, a prayer for someone's brother they ask that he chooses life rather than alcohol. And there is this prayer of thanksgiving on the 35th anniversary of my ordination as a minister of word and sacrament. Gracious God, we pray for these deacons, for in every age you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your people. We thank you for those that you have called to serve you. Give them special gifts to do their special task and fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they may have the same mind that was in Christ. May they be faithful disciples as long as they shall live and set them apart for this work to which they have been called by the voice of the church. Grant them your heavenly wisdom. Fill them with your grace that they may good and be good and faithful servants for you and your church full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, ruling in reverence to you. Give them that favor and influence with the people which come from following Christ, 
and allow them to faithfully lead this congregation in faithful service. We pray for this congregation, asking for the courage and discipline to follow where your servants rightly lead, that together we may declare your wonderful deeds and show your love to the world through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. And now we pray as we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are now deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Welcome to this ministry. You may be seated. Let us now offer our gifts to God.
us pray. Yours, O Lord, are grandeur and power, majesty, splendor, and glory. All in the heavens and on the earth is yours, and of your own we give you. Bless these gifts and those who offer them. May they speak the hope of your kingdom and the joy that we have in Jesus Christ to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now go out into the world in peace. Hold fast to that which is good. Give to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Strengthen the downhearted. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.